I'm Brendan Coogan, freelance reporter with a growth mindset ready to take on everything EV. And this is EV TV. Welcome to EVTV, the show that tells you everything you need to know on the subject of electric vehicles. We're coming to you today from near Bonn, Germany, outside one of four DHL Global Innovation Centres. We know that electric vehicle sales are set to account for over half of all new car sales by 2040, and given the advances in technology, could be even sooner. One of the drivers for all of this, it's the increasingly exciting and popular Formula E series. And we go green under the lights. Hi, I'm Adrien Dedieu from DHL, expert in auto mobility and EV logistics. Whether you work in EV battery manufacturing, manage car dealership, or any business involved with the future of electric vehicles, this series is for you. I'm also here at the DHL Innovation Center near Bonn. These centers are situated all around the world, in Europe, in Asia, in the Americas, and even in the Middle East. They serve as stimulating customer engagement platforms, where, by demonstrating real-world innovation, the future of logistics can be experienced today. In a previous episode, we explored the environmental advantages of hybrid and electric vehicles. In this episode, we're looking at how sustainable the actual EV value chain really is. As the global appetite for electric vehicles grows, EVs are the short and mid-term solution to reduce mobility emissions. But when looking at the carbon footprint of emissions within the whole cradle-to-grave value chain, is the story as clear-cut? With this in mind, many suppliers that provide components for vehicles powered by internal combustion engines face significant challenges if they can't adapt quickly and sustainably to match the pace of change. So, why is the EV supply chain so different? Well, did you know? EVs are radically simpler than fossil fuel-driven vehicles, and in mechanical terms, they rely on far fewer traditional components. In fact, an EV drivetrain contains around 20 moving parts, as opposed to the 2,000 parts found in a conventional internal combustion engine vehicle. On average, about 25% of the internal combustion engine vehicle supply chain doesn't translate for EVs. Does this mean it's much easier, as there's less to move around in the supply chain? Well, not necessarily as EV battery logistics are highly complex and require sophisticated tracking and measurement for safe transport and storage. EV manufacturers also rely as much on technology software providers as they do on mechanical engineers, so the supplier mix is very different. So, often simpler, but not always easier. We all understand that the adoption of EVs will significantly reduce downstream emissions those controlled by an automotive organization, including cradle-to-gate and end-of-life processes. But what about the reduction of emissions upstream in areas they don't directly control? Even though the total share of emissions through logistics is small, OEMs and suppliers are nevertheless setting targets to reduce them. For those of you who don't know, there exists the International Greenhouse Gas Protocol that categorizes industrial emissions into three distinct groups or scopes. Scopes one and two monitor direct emissions generated through production, including combustible fuels, IC emissions, electricity, steam, heating, and cooling. Scope three addresses all indirect emissions, including transportation and distribution, both up and downstreams. With OEMs already investing in reducing scope 1 and 2 emissions, their focus now falls into scope 3 category. As a result, 
the automobility sector is demanding greener logistics solutions for all its service provider. Well, to look at what sustainable solutions are being introduced or considered by the EV logistics sector in order to meet these demands, I spoke with Silius Kolstadt, Senior Vice President Corporate Strategy for the DPDHL Group. Hello, Celia, and welcome to EVTV. Hello, thank you very much. What is it like these days at times of unprecedented change for the industry? Well, um, as you can imagine, um, fairly um, challenging. And I think uh, it starts with recognizing um, the CO2 footprint that we're actually having with the thousands of cars and planes and um, the things that move around um, for us and our customers every day. I think. What um, was new with the sustainability roadmap, and I brought it with me here, um, it is that our aim is to have um, clean operations for climate protection. And we have pledged 7 billion euros um, towards um, getting that done. That's a lot of money, but we know money is quickly spent. So where will you act first in order to progress on the sustainability roadmap? One area that is very crucial for us as a company um, when it comes to reducing our emissions, and that is really um, being able to count these emissions properly. Um, so that area of, of carbon accounting, if you wish, is one that um, uh, it's not only something that we are working on, but the whole industry and actually the whole world is trying to find the right standards and how we should price um, um, emission and how we should do that carbon accounting. And uh, of course, that's super important um, for us because we have um, as a goal to have a green alternative to every product and solution uh, that we are having. If, if we look at it from the way that we have um, air freight, we got ocean freight and we got road freight. And we have as an aim to have a 30% sustainable fuel blend across um, uh, those three modes. So for air, of course, it's about what is called SAF or, the, or, or sustainable um, aviation fuels. If we look at roads, a lot of that has to do with electrification, um, of course. And our goal here um, uh, is to have a, I think, 60% of a last mile fleet electrified by um, uh, 2030. And with electrification, as you know, it's not only uh, to have the electric vehicles, it's also to have the charging infrastructure in place. And the last thing I'd like to mention, uh, where we are looking to have every new warehouse we open carbon uh, neutral. I think it's fair to say that technology plays an important role, especially when it comes to actually decarbonizing um, uh, what we are doing across roads and air um, and ocean. Is it all about technology or are there other ingredients um, to put into our plate in order to, to achieve this uh, sustainable goal? So one thing that we are really good at um, is about optimizing global supply chains. Um, and imagine every kilometer less uh, driven or flown um, uh, is a kilometer less of carbon emissions. It's a lot about making sustainability part of our mindset and part of how we think about our daily business. Thank you very much, Celia. Uh, what's for sure is that at EVTV here, we have the right mindset towards sustainability and we're anxious to see how this roadmap will actually come to life. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you. We have here with us DHL Express Europe uh, Clean Operation uh, Program Manager, Marijn Slaberkorn. Marijn, thank you very much for being here with us. Tell us about uh, what are the uh, sustainability program for DHL Express in Europe. Yes, of course. I think a lot have been said already about electric vehicles, but I think it also may be clear that it's not uh, limited to electric vehicles only. I think network efficiency, biofuels, our service partner network, where we already have more than 40,000 service points over Europe, I think this is also a very important topic uh, for, uh, for in our sustainability program. If you talk about electric vans, how do we supply these vans with electricity? It needs to be green, local produced, or anyways uh, purchased green. Why already in some countries, maybe, and not in others? It's not that easy to implement electric vehicles everywhere. There is a difference uh, uh, in countries, uh, for instance, in the eastern part of Europe, where sometimes people never have seen an electric van, versus the more developed countries in this area, uh, where we talk about UK or Netherlands or Belgium. And as a fact, we have now almost doubled already the amount of electric vehicles in one year uh, versus what we have done until the end of 2020. 
So doubling uh, the fleet in such a short time, what are really the challenges of implementing those? Um, I think we have been doing quite well uh, up, to, up to now, but as said, we need to have the right solutions yeah? because uh, we were, are always looking to uh, a specific kind of van where we can take enough volume uh, uh, with parcels to deliver to our customers. Um, and these are just coming to market as we speak in 2021, but with a larger implementation in 2022. For every vehicle, we need to have a charger. Yeah, but it's not that you implement a charger every time you implement an electric vehicle, but you need to think about how you do it smart, yeah, because we need to make sure our vehicles are full in the morning and we don't pressure the electricity net too much. What are really the feedback or the wishes of the driver of these new technology vans? That they can do exactly the same with the vehicle as they did, that they could do with a diesel van. The solution that we provide to the couriers and needs to work always. That means that we need to have a backup plan. For instance, when we have power downs during the night that the vehicles restart automatically and therefore we build in a, a contingency plan to make sure this, uh, this always is the case. Um, but to be honest, yeah, if you talk to a courier uh, that has been driving an electric vehicle for a while, they don't want to go back to diesel anymore. That's great to hear. So, Marijn, thank you too much for uh, your uh, contribution. Thank you very much, Silvio, Marijn and Fabio. We are concentrating on exploring sustainable EV logistics solutions. But we know these solutions nearly always assume a high level of safety is maintained, particularly in the movement of batteries. So, just how dangerous is it to transport huge quantities of EV batteries? outside this fantastic new DHL Express facility in Berlin, Germany. This building has recently started operations and through the use of environmentally friendly technologies is helping to achieve substantial energy and carbon savings. It operates a carbon neutral delivery service where possible using a fleet of 61 fully electric vehicles to help deliver to the wider Berlin area. It's hoping to provide a sustainable template for future German sites. To learn a little bit more about just how wonderful this site is, earlier I spoke to the CEO of DHL Express Germany, Marcus Reckling. So Marcus, thank you very much for joining us on EVTV. First of all, you're an early adopter of electric vehicles. I believe you even traveled from Bonn to Berlin to be here. Yes, indeed. I used my own fully electric vehicle to drive here to Berlin, and it was no problem at all. I had to charge twice on the fast charging infrastructure, but it was a total charging time of half an hour. And, you know, so very easy, very convenient. And, you know, you feel good because you've done something in a sustainable way. So first of all, let's talk about this magnificent building uh, that we've come to visit. Um, Tell us a little bit about it. Well, this is the latest addition to our DHL Express network in Germany. It's a state-of-the-art facility for Berlin. And this is also one of our most sustainable buildings. You know, we've put a lot of things in here. Um, we've got the solar panels on the roof. We've got an eco-friendly green roof. We're using, of course, LED lighting. We're having a heat pump for heating. So we put a lot of stuff into this building. And of course, this building is also the home of our project with 61 fully electric vehicles for Berlin, where basically the majority of the, of the inner city of Berlin will be delivered in a totally carbon neutral way. It's been a big investment from DHL, but this isn't the end of it. It's, it's just the beginning, you were telling me. Yes, of course, this is only the first step into the area because the next project, for example, we're doing in Bremen, which will already take this to the next level and will probably reduce CO2 emissions compared to this building by 30 to 50% further. And then the next project, I have a clear ambition of building is um, zero emissions building. So fingers crossed that we will be successful with that. Now, my passion is electric vehicles. Tell me, what are the advantages of having 
having a fully electric delivery fleet. One well, of the key advantages, of course, being carbon neutral. You know, on the journey to becoming carbon neutral on the last mile, electric fleet is key. But that's only one piece of it, you know. The other piece is, you know, there is less noise in the inner cities, there is less pollution in the inner city. So there's a plenty of advantages. And last but not least, we see a big engagement advantage also with, with electric vehicles, where really um, we can make our people proud of working for us with these electric vehicles. In terms of that last mile, because you are the express element of DHL, um, is there any range anxiety from drivers? We believe that with the vehicles we have at the moment, we can deploy up to 1,000 electric vehicles in Germany, which gives us roughly one third of our fleet as being fully electric. But then, of course, our ambition is to go to 75% by 2030. And for that, we do need some technological innovation. But, you know, I'm very optimistic because the next vehicles that are coming out are already extending the range to up to 200 kilometers, which I'm sure will close the gap in order to really reach the 75% target by 2030. Excellent. Thank you, Marcus. Now, it's always good to talk to the boss, but what's it like working in operations here in this great facility in Berlin? Um, what's your name and what's your job title? Yeah, hello. My name is Ömer Eschelik and I'm the supervisor by the Hale Express. And what does your job mean on a day-to-day -day basis? Na, meine Aufgaben hier sind sehr vielschichtig, aber im ähm, Großen und Ganzen äh, bin ich für die Steuerung des Inbound-Prozesses zuständig und ähm, bin auch derjenige, der für meine Mitarbeiter da ist, um sie zu coachen. This great facility has been here over a year now. What difference has it made to your job? Ja, die neue Facility bietet uns auf jeden Fall eines Menge Möglichkeiten. Die Arbeitsbedingungen wurden auf jeder Hinsicht verbessert und sie hilft uns auch mit unserem neuen Sorter für unsere Kunden einen besseren Service zu bieten. Are there any advantages or disadvantages to running an electric vehicle fleet? Das größte, die größte Herausforderung aktuell bei unseren Modellen, die wir hier einsetzen, ist maximal die Reichweite. Die maximale Reichweite beträgt bei den meisten Modellen 130 km. Und äh, deswegen ist es uns nur möglich, die City damit zu befahren. Und ähm, generell werden äh, die Autos immer eingesetzt bei Touren, die weniger als 100 Kilometer fahren. Aber das ist wirklich, ähm, der Großteil der City wird mit diesen Fahrzeugen abgedeckt. Und wir sind sehr stolz drauf. Okay, Omer, thanks for having us today. You're doing a good job. Thank you very much. Renewable energy generation hits an all-time high. According to a report published by the Paris-based International Energy Agency, this year is expected to set an all-time high for new renewable energy production. New solar installations, wind farms and other technologies around the world have added 290 gigawatts of renewable power production. Based on these trends, renewable energy could exceed the global capacity of fossil fuels and nuclear energy combined by 2026. Great news for greener charging, and for once, a positive climate story for our planet. So, Fabio, I think what we've seen in this episode, it, it's quite clear. Um, the future for the EV value chain and supply chain has to be sustainable. A sustainable supply chain for a sustainable product. But how do we see actually players of the industry um, thinking about this? Are they moving in the, into that direction? Some of them have already said by 2040 or 2050, our supply chain must be carbon neutral. Therefore, they've already given a clear message to the market. Others which are working on that. But yeah, that's ultimately where everybody needs to go if they want to stay into the green and the sustainable market. Supply chains are com very complex beasts, right? Um, where do we start acting? Where do we invest first in order to have a significant impact on CO2 in the supply chain? If I just snap like this, I think, you know, EV fleet, it's a, an easy way to start reducing your carbon uh, emissions. In reality, the supply chain is far more uh, complex and uh, what the next steps we need to take is about having green assets like warehouses, offices, that's all contributes to that uh, emissions and in addition to that you need to work on supply chain optimization considering a moment like this where we have several disruptions around the world in terms of supply chain 
what happens is that you risk even to have an increase of emissions because you use last minute solution just to avoiding the disruption. So resilience in that case, or a resilience program, has a, a vital role to ensure that you can keep under control the supply chain optimization. Whole logistics providers can accelerate this momentum towards sustainable supply chains. Whole logistic provider can take the lead here in order to support the industry. That is a great question. Even if I would say proudly that DHL has already taken quite a substantial steps in that direction. Uh, so we don't limit to uh, supply to our customer CO2, uh, for example, um, reports. But what we're really working with our customer is reading through those data and try to work with them and see how we can even further reduce by optimizing processes, optimizing mode of transportation, and optimizing the way the, um, the processes are then finally put on, on place in, in all over the world. All right. Thanks a lot, Fabio, for your expertise and your insights today. I Thank know you. we will see much more of you in the next episodes, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. We're aware that the EV supply chain is very different to what automotive suppliers have been used to, with typically over 2,000 moving ICE drivetrain parts being reduced to just 20 on an EV. And that the whole value chain must be operated sustainably, with the aim of carbon neutrality within 10 to 20 years. OEMs are expecting rapid progress on Scope 3 upstream emissions targets for services, including distribution and transport. Obviously, establishing electric vehicle delivery fleets can substantially help in meeting these targets. As ever, this series is for you. So if you found it interesting, check out our previous episodes using the link on the screen below. Tune in to episode 5 soon to explore the changing EV landscape.